quick announcement for the books. For all the books, we need to buy them from the Amazon bookstores, and we can then get them signed by the authors at the author signing area after each session. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, brought to you by Rajni Gandha. We are at Mahindra Humanities Center, Darbar Hall. A thousand stories, tales of hope and dispossession. We've got Hansda Sovendra, Aruni Kashyap, introduced by Neeta Gupta. Hello and welcome, friends. Uh, can you hear me? So welcome to this session, A Thousand Stories, Tales of Hope and Dispossession. Uh, Urvashi Butalia, who was supposed to be here, got caught in the fog and got, was delayed. So I'm just stepping in her place. So if I falter, please excuse me. Uh, now we have uh, with us today two very talented authors, Hansada Sovendra Shekhar from uh, Jharkhand. Uh, he's a medical officer in Jharkhand, and he's, his debut novel, The Mysterious Ailment of Rupi Baski, was recently shortlisted for the Hindu Prize 2014. So uh, Hansada also writes short stories which have been featured in various liter literary magazines like Indian Literature, Lalit, and a couple of other magazines. So welcome to Jaipur Literature Festival, Hansada. It's a, Pleasure to have you here. Besides that, Hansada and I are also Facebook friends, and this is the first time we're meeting. So it's wonderful to be here with you. And then we have Aruni Kashyap, whose moving novel, his uh, debut novel, uh, a House with a S uh, Thousand Stories, is uh, uh, you know uh, really made waves when it was published. Uh, uh, it was uh, two years ago. Two years ago, and Aruni is also a, a writer and a translator. Yeah, and he's equally com comfortable uh, writing in both Assamese and in English. And he's also recently published an Assamese novel called Sami Ronor Pasot, and also translated the works of the tra very celebrated uh, Assamese author Indira Goswami. He's translated her works into English, which was published by Ruban. And Aruni is also uh, Charles Wallace uh, uh, scholarship holder in 2009. So he's, he's now presently teaching at the Ashoka University. 
and uh, he will be telling us, uh, he will be sharing his, uh, uh, telling us about his novel. So I think what distinguishes both these writers to, uh, that we have with us today is their rootedness in their language and their milieu. Both of them are urban Indian men who, you know, lived in Delhi, he's lived in the US, he's lived in, uh, uh, you know, traveled a lot. Both of them are, you know, have their careers in the city. Yet they chose to write stories which were set in their villages, in little towns, in, you know, uh, uh, in communities which are rarely talked about in the national media. So these are stories which were revelatory and the compelling characters you know, take you to, they transport you to another world. So I think to begin with, what I'd like to do is invite you both to tell us something one by one. I'd like you both to tell us something about your novels, because there may be readers here who have not yet read your novels. So I'd like you to tell us something, because uh, Aruni's novel is set against the uh, Assam, Assam insurgency times, and you know, it deals with the secret, uh, the ruthless secret killings that were happening during the insurgency, yet it's a novel which, which is told with great love and care. So uh, I'd like you to tell us something, and Hansada's novel, on the other hand, is set against the tribal movements in the Santhal region. So both of you, if you could tell us something about, we can, that's how I'd like to start this session, to know more about your novels. Yes, so Aruni, can you go first? Thank you, Nita. Um, uh, thank you for coming here, everyone. Um, my novel is uh, set against uh, Assamese insurgency, yes. Uh, the, the armed Assamese separatist insurgency started in 1979. But, but between, towards the late 90s, there was a series of extrajudicial killings that were conducted allegedly by the government forces, state forces, in order to uh, curb the insurgency. And these killings were uh, committed by um, uh, the government forces uh, and the state forces, uh, tr also through many proxy uh, agents. And they targeted sympathizers of the armed insurgency. This uh, targeted uh, the relatives, friends, brothers, sisters, immediate relatives, distant relatives, good friends from college, anyone. So there were reprisal killings, so there was this whole state was soaked in this uh, blood uh, of uh, due to fratricidal conflict. Uh, during this time, um, there was a sense of terror and fear and insecurity among the people. And I was a high school student at that point of time. And uh, I, I, I remember uh, living through it in the city, though the city was not the most affected, but there were narratives that would reach our um, you know, drawing rooms through newspaper again and again. Um, Many people have asked me why I set my novel against this very bloody period. And the novel is a love story. Yeah. Uh, it, in fact, there are three parallel doomed love stories happening in the novel. And there's a wedding taking place and people are having a lot of fun. So I've been asked a couple of times why I did this, you know. Um, some people have expected a very simple narrative of torture and violence and, and more information about the secret killings or the insurgency, while others have wondered um, why is this juxtaposition? I think it was very involuntary, but at the same time, probably I know, uh, because I'm very conscious as a writer and, uh, and what I write about, I, this was, I mean, my generation who grew up in the 80s, were born in the 80s, we don't know what it means to live in a peaceful Assam, because after 1979, when the insurgency started, everything changed. My parents' generation know, they know what, what it means to live in a peaceful Assam, peaceful Northeast, because their, time, their memories are divided between 79, before 79, and after 79. We don't have that. And I think it was, I wanted to write something that meant a lot for me, for my generation, uh, and also this was something that uh, I constantly grew up with. So I wanted to probably write the love story of this 17-year-old guy called Pablo, uh, which didn't go down very well. <laughs> Thank you. Hansada, tell us something about the, you know, the tribal experiences and the, you know, the, uh, the stories that you tell from your land. Johar, thank you, Nita, and thank you all of you for coming. I'm very happy to speak about my novel, The Mysterious Ailment of Rupi Baske. I am a Santhal. Rupi Baske, my heroine, she is a Santhal who comes from a Santhal family, lives in a Santhal village. My novel is all about Santhals because this is the community, these are the people who I have known. And the story of Rupi Baske, as I have already mentioned in my acknowledgments page, has been inspired 
uh, it takes cues. Yeah, it has been inspired. It takes cues from an incident which took place in my village and is a creation of village gossip and my imagination. There is something which happened in my village. There is a family who we know. And uh, I learned from my family and from the people in my village about these people, this family, and the members of that family. And I thought that, yes, this would make a nice story. They have a nice story. And this story was always in my mind. Like, uh, it was from my mind since the day I started understanding stories. So I thought that, yes, I could write something on this and that I should, I should write on this. And one day in 2011, I couldn't really stop myself. And in five months, I just poured the whole story out. And I did not really have to think much about how I should be writing this story because it was always there in my mind. And alongside the story of this particular family, whose story I have produced in my novel, are the stories which I have heard, which I have heard from my family, from my father, my mother, my auntie who raised me, my father's younger sister. My father is an amazing storyteller. My mom, she is a doctor as well. And uh, she was still in medical college studying when I was born. So when I was very little, she used to bring me stories, uh, storybooks from Rachi, the place where she studied. There is a very a beautiful bookstore there called Good Books. So she used to bring me all those story books published by CBT, the Children's Book Trust. It was a very beautiful publishing house at that time. So there were stories from the Mahabharata, there were uh, Puranic Kathai and everything. And I was raised by my father's younger sister, uh, my aunt. And these are the three people I have dedicated my book to. And my father's younger sister, my aunt, she is an amazing storyteller. Most of the gossip, most of the village stories, whichever I have heard, whichever I have grown up with, they have all come from her. So all those stories, the songs, my father used to sing songs to me. My auntie, she used to sing songs to me. My mother, she encouraged me to read, to take in stories, to tell stories. So all those stories, they have all been uh, gathered and they have been placed in this book. My book was not, uh, uh, it did not have a political you know, background at first. It was like my editor, Anurag Basnet, he's here in the audience. He told me, your book is an insulated fable. It was an insulated fable, really. It was not, uh, it, it, did not have, it did not have any history of the place where it is based. It is based in Jharkhand. Let me add that. It was just a plain story about a family, about this woman, Rupi Baski, and all those beautiful stories that I've grown up with. So Anurag, he suggested that you are writing about a place that not many people know about. So why don't you just give it some kind of a, you know, a background against something? So I thought, okay, if I have to tell the story of my place, of my times, then why do not I put the story of my home state, my Jharkhand? So that is how the Jharkhand struggle came into this. That is how Jaipal Singh Munda and other political leaders like uh, Shibu Soren and Surya Singh Besra, they make an appearance in this book. Although it is not exactly a political novel, there's a dash of political affairs in it, but it is, in my words, uh, a social novel, samajik upanyas, as we say. Thank you. Yeah, as to that, uh, I think you know you were talking about your aunt bringing you up and yeah. your mother's, uh, you know, I mean, in her uh, career and things like that. Uh, that I think also explains to an extent the kind of very strong women character exactly. that both of you do. I mean, you have Ahalya Jethai in your novel and other characters, and you have Rupi Baski, who's despite her ailments, such a strong character. So can you, uh, can you t tell us something about this, the strength of your women characters? Because I think that would be of interest to all of us here. If yeah, sure, Nita. Uh, the women characters in my novel, like Nita, has, Nita said just now, and I have heard from a number of my readers, they are very strong. They were intended to be strong. I couldn't help it because I have grown up in a family with very strong women. My mom, she's a career woman. My aunt, she has raised me in the absence of my parents. She raised me and she used to look after the entire household. In my village, I have aunts who uh, run the <coughs> village house. And it's not really easy because there are so many things involved. 
there's the farm, there are the animals, there are, you know, the people who work in the house, they have to be uh, given the dues. So it is, uh, you know, it is qu quite an amazing thing that women can handle so many things at once. So that is why it was natural that Rupi Baske should be a strong woman. However, it is not only Rupi who is the strength of this novel, there are also two other women characters, Putki and Della. Putki is Rupi's mother-in-law. She's supposed to be a wayward woman, but she, in my opinion, she is quite an independent woman who thinks for herself. And there is her friend Della, who is supposed to be a bad woman as, you know, as people in the village, they think about her. But I think they symbolize the kind of women who, who can think, who know what they have to do, who know what they want to have. So I think that's quite an amazing thing. And so since I've, always, uh, since I've grown up in the midst of strong women myself, so it was natural that, yes, the women characters in my novel have to be and strong. So I think at this point it might be nice if you read out something from uh, yeah, sure. yeah, a little bit about Rupi Baski or yeah. you choose, of yeah, course. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nita. Uh, the part which I'm going to read out is uh, the part about uh, Della and Putki. This is how many pages? Uh, okay. Della and Putki. Della would come to Putki's house each morning and off they would go. They plucked mangoes and guavas when they were in season, swam in the Kadamdihi stream and played chokoshta and hopscotch with the older girls who herded cattle on the banks of the stream. When they grew up, the two would stand by the main road with the other older girls and chat up the dark, muscular, sweat-soaked young men who would be returning after working on their farms or the mills in Chakulia. Chichi, these girls are a disgrace. The women of Kadamdihi, especially those from the Maji Gushti, would say, the Naiki's wife is a shameless woman, but what is younger Sumai Budhi doing? Younger Sumai Budhi was bleeding. Perhaps it was the heartbreak or the sense of failure a daughter of a farmhand, she had been made the wife of a member of the Maji Gushti of Kadamdihi. And what had she done in return? Nothing. The pain in her loins, the spotting she observed at times on her monochrome saris were the price younger Sumai Budhi was paying for her failure. As if the village had not been scandalized enough by the pair's behavior, Della went to work for a rice meal in Chakulia as a laborer. And as if that were not enough, Putki tagged along. Each morning, they would wake up, tie their best saris low at the waist, polish their faces with talc, oil, plait and adorn their hair with red ribbons, pack soredaka in tall aluminum tiffin carriers, and leave for the rice meal in a gaggle of giggling girls. bahako, chakuriya bajar kamikuriko. They all tie their hair with red ribbons, these young women, who work in the chakuliya bazaar. With their jobs came money and freedom. They bought more saris and cosmetics. They made trips to various patas, gayans, and other gatherings, where they downed glass after glass of honey and matkam powder and met many men. Most of them lusted for the ebony-skinned, full-breasted Della, while some were attracted by the slender, fair by Santhal standards, Putki. There came a point when Putki and Della stopped addressing each other by their names. Keeping in mind the four-year age gap between them, Della used to call Putki, Putki Mai, and Putki used to call Della, Della Dai. However, times were changing. There was excitement and promise in the air. In Chakulia, wherever Della and Putki went, people said that the country was free. They said that the Ingraj had left and that the Sarkar would be run by our own people. Much more exciting than national freedom was the prospect of a separate land for the Hor people, for the Adivasis. At Patas, at Gayans, wherever young Santhal men and women gathered, they could hear the name of Jaipal Singh. Jaipal Singh was a Munda from Khoti in Ranchi. He had studied at Oxford University and had captained the Indian hockey team, which won gold in the 1928 Olympics held in Amsterdam. Singh founded the Adivasi Mahasabha in 1938, which demanded a separate state called Jharkhand for the Adivasis of the Chota Nagpur region. The Adivasi Mahasabha was renamed the Jharkhand Party after independence. Jaipal Singh was a member of the Constituent Assembly of India, and he had asked for reservations to be granted to Adivasis all over India. Everyone respectfully called him Marangomke, the big gentleman. Ho Santhal Mahale Munda, Abhojoto Boa Runda. Ho Santhal Mahale and Munda. We all purred together like the civet, which we call the Runda. 
Della and Putki heard this anthem on the roads, the song which would unite the chief Adivasi communities of the region, Ho, Santhal, Mahale, and Munda. Jharkhand, the Hihidi Pipidi, the utopia which the Adivasis of the Chotanagpur region had been striving for so long, seemed within reach, like a ripe guava hanging from the lowermost branch of a tree brought down low by its own weight. Just stand on your toes, stretch your arm, and pluck it. With promises blooming around them and romance having taken over their lives, how could Della and Putki remain unaffected? The two maidens found an endearing term with which to address one another, a term they picked up at a Gayan in a village near Chakulia. Riyarbaha, Winterfla. E gate Riyarbaha, e dulal Riyarbaha. Oh my friend Winterfla, oh my beloved Winterfla. This is how they address one another, delicately, as if they were nymphs from heaven. Whether they were in the village, or traveling to work, or at work, or casting naughty glances at men at a pata, it was always Riyarbaha, e gate Riyarbaha. Della would stand outside Putki's door each morning and coo earnestly like a cuckoo in heat. Eh, Dulal Riyarbaha, don't delay, we have a long way to go. Putki would rush out, dressed to kill, arranging her anchar with one hand and carrying the tiffin in the other, and say, Chogate Riyarbaha. The men and women of Kadamdi he could only stare. Of the men that Della met at the Patas, one was called Tira. He was from Horoghutu and was the best looking man in his village. Horoghutu falls midway between Chakulia and Kadamdihi, but it is some distance away from the main road. Kadamdihi and Horoghutu are not directly connected, and if one intends to travel from Chakulia to Kadamdihi via Horoghutu, one has to make a fairly long detour. Horoghutu means the bank of the tortoise. However, just as Kadamdihi had no Kadam trees, Horoghutu had no horror in its ponds and streams. There were, perhaps, old men and women in that village who, after drinking hari, could tell stories about how they would once kill tortoises and make delicious stew from their flesh. But no one had heard anyone say anything about the tortoises of Horoghutu. Tira was handsome, magnetic even. He was tall, had broad shoulders, muscular arms, and large eyes. His dark body had been burnished by the heat of the earth. He was a to-do, a typical to-do pura rusika, with charm enough to attract women like flies. Young women listened to him as if he were a messenger from Maranguru himself who had come to teach them the art of love. Girls, I am like the bark of the karam tree, he would tell his admirers, who would giggle shyly and eye him from the corners of their eyes. They wanted to meet his eyes, but would become self-conscious at the very last moment. Yet, when he pounded the tamak and the tumda at festivals, the same shy women would compete with one another to fall into rows and move to Tira's intricate beats. They are made for each other, the women of Kadamdi said about his pairing with Della, Begarjan or Marijan. Tira was an orphan who had been raised by relatives in Horoghutu. They lived in their house, worked on their farms, and herded their cattle and goats. It made no sense for the Bajar Kami Kulikor of Kadamdihi and nearby villages to venture off the main road and make a detour through Horoghutu. But that was what they would do. It would be quite late. The young Guti Kodak of Horoghutu would be lounging outdoors on summer evenings, smoking beeries, laughing and chatting about women, tuning the strings of their banam, singing songs, relaxing after a long day of work, or after having drunk a glass or two of cool, refreshing hari, be waiting for dinner. The gaggle of Bajar Kami Kuriko would enter the main pool here of Horoghutu innocuously, as if they were visitors just passing through. They too would be tipsy, and they would be singing one of the songs which were then popular in the patas. E hapon mai hapon mai, silda patadam chala asabang. Young girl, my dear young girl, will you go with me to the pata in silda? The men, lazing around on cots and tuning the strings of the banam, would be waiting for this song. They would spring to their feet and run, leaving everything behind, banam, bidi, everything. Some of them would even untie their dhotis and fling them aside so that they wouldn't trip. Sap ko peya, sap ko pe. They would shout to one another. Each one would catch up with his enamorata, Tira with Della, and Salku with Putki. Each pair would wander off to a secluded corner outside the village, behind a bush or under a shady tree, or a white patch in the fallow, romance under moonlight. Thank you, Anshita. That was beautiful. You know, I love the way you use your language in, you know, with such, uh, there's a kind of a natural flow to the, uh, to your Logan, Santale dialect, which again brings me to your book, and I'd love you to read a part from it also. Tell us about some of your women characters, and I mean, what I found interesting while reading your book is that you use Assamese terms 
freely through the book with no glossary explaining anything. So, you know, but yet we hang on to every word and, you know, the Jethais and the Baidos and the, uh, you know, they become part of our own uh, sort of uh, yeah. landscape at that point. So, if you, you know, if you could tell us something about your women characters and read something from <coughs> your book and also comment on your use of language. On, uh, okay, sure. Thank you, Nita. Um, I, I mean, I, I wrote what I saw, so it was very natural for me to um, write strong, I mean, I mean, did not intend to write strong women characters. Uh, I think what's, what's really significant about the women in this novel, in my novel, and the, and the people I see in, in our village, in my ancestral village, is that they're very strong, intelligent women, but they don't have options. So there's a scene in the book where um, they're fighting about a drop of mustard oil because one, one, uh, one aunt suggested that they are all in mourning and fasting. They cannot have oil. Uh, this is uh, during the death of a person. That, you know, there's, there's a guest. Can he add some oil to the mashed potato? <laughs> and there was a big fight about it because, because the Oholla Jathai, she thinks that it's going to bring in bad omen. She sets the rule. Yeah, the she sets the rule and she's very powerful. So, and this is something I saw and I found it very hilarious. But at the same time, um, I think I understand and sympathize with it also why they would spend so much time fighting about very small issues because they don't have op many other options. The, the society did not give them options to venture out and do interesting and things despite their intelligence. Um, I'm going to read a very, sh uh, regarding the language, yes, I actually I, li I, I like to say that I'm an Assamese writer uh, always and I write Assamese novels in English <laughs> or Assamese fiction in English and uh, uh, it's, it's very important for me to, uh, uh, to, to uh, represent the the speech patterns um, and the metaphors and the flavor of the language uh, when I write English as well. Uh, so because because um, I think that makes it uh, rooted and I, I think that makes it uh, uh, true and real f to me. Um, I'm going to read a very short section. Um, this is um, this is uh, from a section when um, uh, uh, there are two characters, Mridul and, and Pablo. And Pablo is from the city and he is Mridul's uh, second cousin. And they're very good friends. And it is their bond that, can, that kind of gets unsettled during the course of the novel. Um, and uh, Pablo wants to know uh, why Mridul avoids a certain part of the road all the time when he goes to the market. And Mridul doesn't want to tell him. And Mridul is upset because Ohola Jata has just given him a big scolding. And uh, he, he's telling Pablo why he's very upset, why he actually avoids that part of the road while he walks to the, uh, walks to the, to the market. And as he says, he says a lot of things about the bloody political situation that was going on at that point of time. Uh, Mridul waited, his Adam's apple moved up, down, up. He wiped the tears with the tips of his fingers. He said it was a nice day, clear blue skies. They could even hear the distant bleats of goats. They could see the kites flown by young boys in the East Bengali village. It was a Sunday. So they had all woken up late, but the younger ones had woken up first since they had planned to go fishing, get some crabs, get some pork from the Karbi village, prop up a hut in the middle of the empty fields, and have dinner together that night. Eat forbidden food. The fields were bright yellow. The skies looked peaceful. Midul had first gone to Brikudar's house to tell him about the plan. From there, they had walked to Binod's house and then to the market. No one was around. The dogs were barking so loudly, and since the dogs were barking in the village, dogs from the neighboring villages had also gathered, but they were scared. They didn't come into the marketplace, into the terrain of the Hatimura dogs. They were barking from a distance, and there were crows. In the chorus, they had shattered the beautiful silence of that morning. Mridul said that he had wondered when he had reached Brikudar's house why the crows and the dogs were making, making such a racket. Brikudar's mother had said probably something was dead, a dog, a crow, a big fat fox, something. You know, if you kill a crow, the rest of the crows call like that. For days you wouldn't be able to go anywhere near the dead bird because other crows would attack you with their sharp beaks and taloons. When Mridul had gone to Binod's house, Binod's grandmother had said the same thing. Why were the crows cawing like mad? 
Why were the dogs barking so much in the market? Probably something was dead. Something, a dog, a fox, a buffalo. We didn't care, Mridul continued telling Pablo. It was far away, the shops, I mean, are far away from the house. We saw him first. I don't remember who informed the police, but we saw the body first, only in his red under underwear. He didn't have legs, they had been chopped off. He didn't have fingers, they had been cut off too. His face was twisted as if he was repulsed by a bad smell. It was such a horrific sight, hanging from the electric pole like a dead, electrocuted bat. He was from a nearby village, the brother of an insurgent. Why did they have to torture him like that? Moina Pihi, who had, been the, who had seen the body, couldn't eat for three days. She wretched and wretched. I couldn't sleep for many days as well. Moina Pihi was among the women who cried the most, wondering aloud if the man had loved someone, wanted to marry someone, if he had a sister. His only crime was that he was the elder brother of an insurgent, and the insurgent, his brother, had refused to surrender to the government and take the money that the government was dishing out so that he could return to society by setting up a business. When someone climbed to the pole with a bamboo ladder and cut off the rope that had tied the corpse to the pole by his fingerless wrists, the body had fallen exactly on the portion of the road we avoid stepping on now. It's been almost three months since this happened. More killings are taking place every day, but this was the most horrific spectacle. The East Bengali villagers who use the Pokoria River most of the time say that they have started finding body parts of unknown human beings at regular intervals almost every fortnight or so. They are scared that they haven't even informed the police. But on the ground where the corpse fell, we still can't walk because we saw him first. I will never be able to walk on that spot. I feel his ghost will enter my soul. It is so, it's also a way of respecting the man, you know? His mother had cried so much. We hoped that she would faint and fade away and not have to go through the trauma, but she didn't faint. His wife did, though. The night before, four masked men have taken him, had taken him away from his house. He was sleeping after a meal. They were guests. His wife howled, saying how much he loved the turtle curry. When his corpse fell, the blood had splattered around the pole. Pablo, so much blood. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. One of the most uh, touching parts of the novel. In the novel. Uh, now, coming back to the fact that both of you are city-bred men who chose to write stories, you know, uh, who chose not to write city stories. You could have gone the Chetan Bhagat or the other way and, you know, write stories from... So did you ever think about how difficult it would be to find a publisher? I'm speaking as a publisher here. So did you think that, you know, this story, is it, I mean, is it going to find a publisher? Or did you have a problem finding a publisher? And then, of course, you, your book was brought out by one of the finest publishers in India. So can you tell us something about that process of, you know, the, the writing and the, uh, the actual, you know, bringing it out to the public sp uh, space? Uh, well, first of all, I would like to clarify that I'm not exactly a city person. Uh, the place where I was uh, raised, I was born in Ranchi, of course, that is a city, and that is the capital of Jharkhand now. But after five or ten days after my birth, since I was there in my mother's hostel, I was brought back to Gharshila, where my father used to work. And Gharshila is not exactly a city, it's just a small, you know, a subdivision headquarter. And then after a few days in Gharshila, I was taken to my village, in Chakulia. Chakulia is a smaller block, and uh, it was in my village where I was actually raised. I was like there for two years. Yeah, two years. And then again, I was brought back to Ghatshila where I went to school. Ghatshila, again, I'll tell you, it's not a city. So I'm not exactly a city person. Although I had my education in Jamshedpur, which is the closest big, what we can call a town big or town. a city, uh, I did not really spend much time there. So I, did, uh, I never really got to see uh, the city life, the city life that is gave those bi tall buildings and cars all over the place and fashionable dresses, huge stores. No, they were not a part of my life. This was my life, the things which I have written about, the, you know, the traditional way, uh, the santha life, the village life. That was m uh, what I had al uh, always seen and that was what I was really qualified to write about. Mm -hmm. So that is what I have written. Yes, uh, I did think that uh, 
maybe I wouldn't be able to find a publisher, so I send my book out to so many people, to so many agents and publishers. Uh, but, uh, but I couldn't help it because, you know, uh, this is the only thing which I could write yeah. about. So, yeah. And I think it did impress some yeah. people, like Meru, Meru Gokhale, mm. who was uh, with Random House at that time. Uh, she called me up from London. Mm. She told me that I like your book. Okay, and the very next day, I got this email from Ravi Singh, who was the publishing director at Aleph at that mm. time, that they would love to publish my novel. And I was like, mm. I had, uh, I caught an ailment at that time. That is called insomnia. I couldn't believe that <laughs> my book has been accepted. So that's, so that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. I'm however very much a city person. Yeah. I'm, uh, I uh, grew up in Guwahati yeah. and studied in Delhi. Uh, but, you know, my, my father is from a village. Um, my mother is from Gulaghat city and she had no idea about village until she got married to him. Uh, but my father is from a village and Mayong, the place where his novel is set, mm. is where my grandmother is married from. And Mayong in Assam is known as a place for the practice of Tantra and mm. other kinds of mm. uh, healing chants mm. and things like that. Um, so my parents, I'm very grateful to my parents for giving me the kind of childhood I had. Every, whenever we got holidays, long holidays, short holidays, they would just send us off to the village, mm. and I would grow up with my cousins bathing in the river, um, eating eating all kinds of things that I shouldn't eat, mm. like killing a sparrow and eat and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, uh, then you know, exploring the village and the hills and the forest all the time. So I was I'm very lucky that it, that I had both experience. Um, Chetan Bhagat is another conversation, <laughs> but I when I wrote this book, I had to write this book yeah. uh, because it was so compelling to me. Uh, the story and the characters. And as a student of literature, I had uh, the kind of awareness I had uh, that what kind of book I'm writing. And as a serious fiction writer, or what you call literary fiction writer, I knew that, you know, uh, this is something, I'm not writing to, to, to earn money. Mm. You know, I'm writing, I mean, as a literary fiction writer, I'm aiming to at least ignite mm. a conversation if not change the conversation about literature and politics and society in, mm. in my country. Mm. So uh, obviously uh, uh, sa uh, sales was something very diff, uh, was not in my mind. Mm. Um, thankfully, the book, the first manuscript was um, uh, accepted by a British agent mm. and um, he helped me get a publisher. Mm. So to me, that was not a huge deal, but, mm. but uh, because I had the uh, you know, privilege of studying literature, mm. I knew what I was doing and I was very conscious of how I was doing. And just to you know, explain it a little bit, I mean, when I started writing a novel, it was a li linear novel. Mm. Uh, it was a straightforward linear narrative written in an omniscient voice and it was called City Wedding. Uh, it was initially a short story and expanded into a novella than a novel. Uh, but for me, um, then I realized that I'm writing about the secret killings and it is something um, that happened in, 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 in a state in India where there were so many narratives about the secret killings, but nobody knew what the truth was. Mm. And I knew that I couldn't do justice to create, if I wanted to create a textual equivalent of that, uh, of that, of that fear, confusion, and chaos, I had to write the novel in a non-linear way, and I had to take refuge in a character who didn't know whose perspective would be limited. So that is why I used Pablo, who is 17 years old, who has little idea about the uh, uh, about the uh, historical situation, and he's discovering. So it is through his eyes, it was much more enabling for me to explore the complexities. And the, the novel is written in a non-linear way by moving between 2002, 2008, and 1998. It is because I wanted to create a textual equivalent of the confusion. And there are so many stories competing with each other. Um, also because it is set in a joint family, also because that is an Indian reality, but also because during that time, there are so many narratives, but the official version of who was killing whom and the truth was tucked away in some corner in the government secretariat. Mm -hmm. Somebody was conspiring and people were being killed. Mm -hmm. And there are all these stories that are competing for my attention. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how I wanted to represent in the book. And, and so these are my concerns. My concerns are political and aesthetic. And if nobody had published a book, I would have written another book and tried to get it published. <laughs> talk about this, uh, there's a very deep, very autobiographical sense when, you, when, one, when one is reading your yeah. novel. 
In fact, I think your father even commented that <laughs> is, is this yes. character based on my sister? Yes, or he something. did. Yes, so, yes. You know, would you like to talk? Because you, I remember you mentioned at one of the interviews that these characters came to occupy a space in your head, yeah. and that they refused to budge from there, and they wanted their stories to be told. Yes. So how? I mean, how much were these characters a creation of your own imagination, and how much did you actually live? these experiences and, uh, you know, tell mm. the, the, the stories of people who were there around you. So if you could share some of Yeah, the, the, the wedding is, is uh, very much true. It's actually the wedding of one of my aunts. Uh, and um, during that time, there was this very small rumor. Mm. Um, and, and that got me thinking. Mm. And the rumor um, is the central, uh, you know, it's the central thing in the book. And the book the story revolves around this rumor. So I merged these two things, actually. The character of Hula Jatha is, is created by merging several, several aunts I know. Jatha means elder sister of your father and or mother. And she's created by merging several characters I know uh, who are um, very bossy and matriarchal. Yes. So, so she has the traits of various <laughs> characters. That's why she is, whenever she meets um, someone else, else, it's like almost a nuclear war. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that is why. Um, but she's very much real. Um, there is a lot of me in Pablo, but I'm not Pablo. Um, I was a far more reticent guy when I was 17. Mm. And uh, I definitely didn't have an affair with some village girl, <laughs> as Pablo had. OK. That's for the record. For the record. <laughs> OK. okay uh, coming to you, I mean, you've, you've talked about the, the, you know, the po political and social upheaval in the tribe, in the Santali, the tribal movements. and. Uh, could you share some of the, you know, uh, were these lived experiences? You have shared a bit about that, but so, th you know, the, the, the animistic practices, the, all the things that you talk about in your novel, could you tell us something about, uh, you know? Th yes, the uh, things which I mentioned in my novel, be the religion, we follow Sarna religion, mm. which is an animist, an indigenous religion. Mm. So, about that religion, yes. What I've written in my book is mm. what I have seen. The description of the Jahir, as I can tell you. Jahir is a sacred grove mm. where Santhals go to pray. Because this is not very well known outside yeah, exactly. of uh, Yeah, I understand that, Nita. So, so uh, that is exactly the reason why I have tried to give it in so many uh, mm. details. Yeah. Like at Jahir, you have the shrine of the Maranguru and Jahir Ayo. Yeah. And then there are the other associated shrines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Maybe uh, had Sarna been a more well-known religion, maybe I wouldn't have had to uh, give, so give, all, give so many details. But since it is, uh, uh, since not much is known about mm. this religion and uh, the religious practices of the mm. uh, Santhals, I'm often asked if I'm a Christian Santhal or a Hindu Santhal. I do not understand what is a Hindu mm. Santhal. Mm. I mean, uh, it is quite unacceptable to a lot of people that if they a Santhal, need to categorize you. yeah, they need categorize, to put you in, yeah. yeah. That it is quite unacceptable for a lot of people that if a Santhal is speaking in English, mm. if a Santhal has gone to an English medium school, and my uh, mom, she's a doctor, mm. okay, my dad, he used to work in the copper factory, and we, 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 we have lived in a bungalow there. Mm. So if a Santhal has gone so far, then that Santhal has to be a Christian Santhal. Mm. Okay, so I told him, no, I'm not a Christian. <laughs> and so the next question comes, oh, so you're a Hindu. And I said, no, I'm not a Hindu either. I am a son, and then I have to give so much. To explain. Be, e e e explain. Yeah. So that is why uh, I have explained here that no, Santhals are not Hindu. Santhals have an animist faith called mm. Sarna, uh, the religion called Sarna. Mm. And that is the reason why I have given so many mm. descriptions. I have, mm. that's it. Nita, I didn't, I think, explain your question about the glo yeah. glossary thing. Uh, yeah. 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 I'll just, I'll just touch yeah. upon it. Yeah. Um, you know, so for me, it was very important not to have, not to do these explanations and yeah. glossary. And yeah. for me, um, because I thought that, you know, when I read an American or a British novel, um, nobody explains, explain to me when I was very young, what's the yeah. pie yeah. or something like that, yeah. you know, yeah. or, or the politics. So I didn't want to do that. Um, and it was a political stance. It was a very, very political stance. And um, maybe I have suffered because of it also. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it, it makes the novel more beautiful and, it's, you know, that, as you said, an Assamese, yeah. uh, that the feel of the language comes yeah. through much more than if you had had a glossary at the end explaining. Yeah, and to me, uh, you know, uh, 
when I'm, and I'm very, uh, I mean, again, you mentioned Chetan Bhagat, and one day I might want to write a pulp book, because I love writing yeah. thrillers and horrors, and I, you know, I would like to write and publish one day. Yeah. But uh, this is something I'm doing different, and, yeah. and I know it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something that I wanted, you know, to start or change the conversation. And just tell me, when you, th this is a book that you've mm. written in English, you've also got a novel published in Aspen. Yeah. So could you tell us something about, you know, as a writer, how do you place yourself when you're writing in Assamese and how, when you're writing in, uh, because I remember once you said that you would like to translate this book into Assamese as yeah, well. Yeah, but I couldn't. But yeah. you couldn't. But there was, you know, you said that, you know, if you were to translate it into Assamese, mm -hmm. you would possibly tell the story uh, from a Holia Jatai's point of perspective. Yeah. So could you talk about this, you know, this dual need, this dual space that you occupy as a writer? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and a little bit about your Assamese, because uh, I, have, I haven't had the chance to read the Assamese novel, and hopefully it will get translated and come out, and uh, you might translate yeah. it yourself. So if you could tell us something about your Assamese writing. Um, I, I, I always wrote in two languages from my childhood, actually. Um, and um, I, when I write, I think, about, um, I think about a person from Assam who knows everything about Assam. So for me, the question of audience is very important. And by audience, I don't mean readership or market. I mean who I'm telling this story to. Because I feel that Indian English writers have always had to, have been forced to accommodate the presence of the uh, so-called global reader, mm. non-Indian, or Western reader mostly, uh, and, and, and explain little things and essentialize the Indian experience. And that is something, as an as a academic, as a writer, I, I have always detested. Mm. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. Mm. Um, so, so when I write in English, when I write in Assamese, I imagine that that uh, I'm talking to an uh, an Assamese person, and he may not, or he or she may not know English or Assamese, mm. uh, but they do know about certain things about Assamese culture. Mm. And this is something I learned from from uh, from Toni Morrison, mm. uh, and uh, I think um, she has uh, she's famously uh, quoted as. Uh, I think she talks about invisible man by Ralph Ellison as invisible to who? Mm. You know, invisible not to African American people. Mm. Uh, to her, African American people are not invisible. Mm. So before Toni Morrison, a lot of African American authors used to uh, address, address, the, address the white readership all the time, yeah. explaining little things. And I think she's the one who came in to, and she's the one who debuted and changed all of that. You know, mm. she's very responsible for, for this, for cutting out the white gaze. Mm. Uh, from the from her book, and hopefully I was I'm trying to cut out the global gaze, Western gaze, whatever you call, yeah. from from Indian English fiction. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, now both your books, is there something, Kavindra, that you want your readers to take away? Because uh, there will be many readers who will come out of this hall yes. today. And is there something? Is there a message that you're giving them, or is there something that you'd like them to take? away from the book to take back from this novel of yes, yours. And also, I mean, I'd like you to also talk about your short stories, oh, which have been you. very successful. There's been a lot of uh, reviews online, and I've been reading. Uh, so you know, if you could also talk something about your okay, uh, short yes, stories. Yes, uh, the f uh, first thing which I want to uh, want my readers to take away from my book, uh, from my book, I have written only one book so far. Yeah. So the first thing that I would want my reader to take from my book is about the life of the Santhals. See, this is not the first time that Santhals are being written about. Mm. I, I'm the first Santhals they've written about in, in a, a, how many pages there are? 210 page novel. But earlier, Santhals have been written about, like Santhals formed a part of Anuradha Roy's novel, An Atlas of Impossible Longing. Okay, then very recently, Neil Mukherjee mentioned them in his Booker shortlisted novel, The Lives of Others, although I really do not agree with whatever he has written about Santhals. He has given a very, uh, Aranir Din Ratri-ish kind of vision, a very romantic vision which does not really come close to the actual, uh, uh, the realities. Yeah. The Santhal woman who, he, who Neil Mukherjee has mentioned in The Lives of Others is a complete, the movies that you yeah, see. it is a complete it's replica a of the Simi Garival character yeah. in Aranir Din Ratri. Mm -hmm. Then he mentions that Santhals have graveyards. Mm -hmm. We Santhals do not have graveyards. Santhals who follow Sarna do not have graveyards. We cremate mm. our people. We burn their bodies. And we do not have a community uh, cremation ground. Mm. In each Santhal household, 
these santhals have always been farmers mm. we have owned lands mm. although those lands are being snatched away now for various development projects but traditionally we have been farmers mm. okay hunters gatherers farmers we have owned lands so in each family mm. there is a, a specified space mm. where the members of that family are right. cremated little children yes they are buried mm. but old people adults when they die they are cremated so these are some things which need to be cleared about santhal so that is what i want to uh, through my book i want to tell people that yes this is our life i think i cannot talk about the entire community but there are times when it hurts me that that, 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 that uh, when there's a misrepresentation it hurts me so uh, uh, i do not believe in giving all those uh, lengthy explanations like the one i have given about the jahar but i think it was necessary at one point also the political uh, back, uh, background which i added later on i think that that was needed i'm really lucky to have the editor anurag basne to uh, with whom i work uh, uh, and uh, the putting this uh, political background it was i think uh, needed because people need need to know what all went in the uh, creation of a separate jharkhand state mm. the first thing is that it was i think uh, completely a political creation it is not the jharkhand we sought it is just a division of bihar which took place mm. the jharkhand state the actual map of the jharkhand state as it would have been had it been created according to the ways the uh, fighters of the jharkhand movement wanted yeah. it would have taken parts from uh, odisha and west bengal as well however this was not not what happened yeah. bihar was simply yeah. cut into yeah it was simply cut into part maybe to gather more votes maybe because it was a political it was an election time at that time so i wanted to give this story i wanted to tell about that so that is what i want first of all the readers to know from my book and second thing i want to them to take is a simple story the kind of uh, the insulated fable okay so that uh, because i want to entertain people i don't want to bore them with facts and details i just want to enjoy my story so that is second thing first the facts a little bit of facts so that the uh, whatever yeah the, the ground is pre 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 prepared for the story and then my story that's it how different are your short stories from your novel because you you know with short stories you can take much more risks or you can so uh, uh, well i am a very slow writer i write whenever an idea comes to my mind so my short stories are produced in those particular bouts of uh, inspiration mm. and i'm very lucky that my short stories have been uh, accepted in a very positive way and uh, yes even in my short stories i talk about santhal life like there was this short story which was published in the dholi review yeah. the uh, bhubaneswar based online yeah. magazine which is edited yeah. by mr anu, uh, mr uh, manu dash manu dash yes yeah. so uh, i did not believe that uh, it could be taken so well mm. adivasis will not dance it was based uh, i based that short story over an incident which happened in jharkhand recently about the uh, uh, foundation stone laying of a power project mm. so i wondered they are uh, mm. creating a, a power project here in jharkhand they are taking all the coal for this power project but we in jharkhand do not have that much electricity i mean yeah. most of the time i'm living in pakur which is a small place in jharkhand i have to rely on the inverter electricity yeah. supply yeah. i'm not getting a supply directly from the connection which i have So why is that happening? So this story was which accepted is, in a is, proper way. Which is true of Jharkhand in yeah. other situations also. Hmm. So steel, hmm. the entire steel industry. I the think steel industry is, is in uh, Jharkhand. Yeah. Is, yeah. In Jharkhand, yeah. But uh, the profits. Profits are going are somewhere else. To other states. To other states, yeah, yeah. Other people. So I yeah. think, uh, yeah, I think it's been very interesting talking to both of you, and I'd like to now open it out to the audience. So if there are questions here. Um, um, I think there's somebody with mics there if we can yeah is there someone with mic hello, hello. my question is from hansda so you have written about you have written about a society which is marginalized and almost invisible uh, on the map of mainstream media so please tell us how do you manage to translate those idioms those uh, a uh, way of life into english which is a, an alien language for santhali and also enlighten us about the uh, how the santhali language is doing because we don't know or we don't hear anything about the santhali language uh, 
thank you abdullah bhai for asking this question this was one issue which uh, really uh, i thought about while i was editing my book with anurag yes. i wanted to put in a glossary but personally i do not like a glossary because glossary can be destructive you are reading this book here 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 on page 55 yeah. you find a word here and then you turn the page around to yes. page 200 something okay so that is quite destructive so and i did not want to put it in bracket ek shabd maine dala fir usko bracket mein maine unka matlab mein koshish ki no this is something which i do not want to do footnotes, uh, footnotes uh, kind of diaz used footnotes in a very <laughs> very uh, effective Juno fashion diaz can use but i'm not Juno diaz so <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then i <laughs> Then I saw these novels of Arundhati Roy and Chima Manda Gozi yeah. Adichie. Yeah. They have used Malayalam words, Igbo words, mm. okay, but they have not really bothered to give their meanings. Mm. So that is the kind of uh, uh, writing which Anurag and I decided upon, that we should integrate the Santhal words as well as the meaning. Jahan pe Santhal words hai, unke meanings samjhani koshish ki gai hai. If not, then we just left it. Let it flow, let it flow. Yeah. Abdullah bhai, just let it flow, the words. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we... Hello, my question is for Mr. Kashyap. Hello. Hi. Uh, you are a city person. You, you are a city person. Uh, you have lived in Guwahati. Yet you cared enough to sympathize with the fraternity and write about the uh, very tragic Assamese insurgencies. But h how uh, does the fact affect you that the utter indifference of the city dwellers who do not sympathize with the fraternity. How do you manage with that? And has, and has that found a place in your book? Um, no, that hasn't found, found a place in my book. I, I think in Assam, the situation is slightly different. Um, and we really can't say that, generalize about the urban population that they have no sympathy. It's, I think that it's divided. Uh, but for me, it was not a leap of, of uh, you know, in, 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 in any way to write about non-urban life. In fact, there was one chapter about the book where it is it's set with a city in the city, but yeah, it's mostly rural. Um, as I said, I grew up um, in Guwahati as well as spent most of my vacations in our ancestral house because me and my brother used to trouble them so much that they wanted to export us there all the time. <laughs> so that, is, that gave me the rich experience that I could now write about. And, and I have the most memorable and the dearest memories of my child are in the village. You know, it's about catching a fish and roasting it uh, on the bank um, in a fire and eating it then and there, uh, or, 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 or going to another person's house to steal mangoes, despite having fruits and food in our own house. So those experiences, I think, I'm, uh, is, is really, th 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 those experiences are very valuable. And I'm so grateful to my parents for, for getting rid of us by exporting us to the village. So uh, it was not really a, a leap for me in, in terms of uh, artistic choice. Thank you. You're welcome. It's Bhal really Bhal nice to have an Aha artist Bhal 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 doing such a great job, great effort. Sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. Sorry. Uh, the question is for the two authors. Um, some, some authors, when they write, they, they're very conscious about whether if their books are going to be adapted into films? Uh, a movies? Yeah, the, when some of them write, yeah. they, they want to make the writing very cinematic to see if the screenwriter who is going to make the film into, the book into a film, will be able to do it uh, easily from the way they've written it. Mm. When you guys were writing these books, did you, were you conscious about having your stories translated onto the screen? question. A lot of people have told me that my novel is very visual. I mean, you can feel the place there. But no, it was not my intention to make it more screen friendly or something. It just came out. Uh, yes, screen friendly in a manner. When I created a particular scene, it just, it was right there in front of me, what is happening in that particular scene, which people are talking, which way they are talking, how they are holding their clothes together, how they are moving their hands together. So, yeah, in, in that way, it is, a, it is a visual work. But no, I never intended. <laughs> So that's it. No. <laughs> no, Anika. <laughs> but I would love to sometime write for film. I've just finished a screenplay for an Assamese movie, and I won't name the movie now. 
when it comes out, you'll know. And yes, one more thing, yeah, if someone wishes to make a movie on Rupi, I'm open to, yeah, option it, but <laughs> that's not really interesting. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll write a novel with the movie rights in mind, and it'll be an international movie. I'll deliberately put a white character in it so that Hollywood adopts it. Uh, okay, so I've read both the novels, uh, one after the other, and I, it was it was delightful because there are points of similarity and points of differentiation, uh, both in form and content and the use. But there was some of the just the, the things that came to. And by the way, I think both mo novels lend themselves beautifully to a screenplay adaptation. I think. Um, having said that, <laughs> having said that. Um, you know, uh, there were just a number of points that arose. Well, there are many points that arose, but maybe a couple of them that I could talk about right now. Um, so one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, came to me as I was reading both of uh, the novels, and because I've had, to de you know, things to do with Assam and as, as well as Jharkhand, so somewhere there was an emotional connect with both the novels. Uh, what uh, struck me was that um, both the novels are placed in what could what could be called a kind of pastoral rural, or there is a background of a pastoral rural, um, you know, uh, in both the novels. And this past when we, we when we talk of the rural, we look at it as a beautiful pastoral, or think or imagine, especially people who are in the metropolis always imagine uh, the, the rural to be a kind of beautiful, lovely, pastoral uh, place. Uh, what was interesting was that while it was beautiful in its definition, yet there was this simmering violence that, was, that, that is there in, in the pastoral. Um, the ulfa and all the insurgency, um, the, the kind of violence that you see happening to the men and the women uh, of the Santali tribe in different, different ways, in different ways, um, not necessarily through insurgency or the gun. Um, and I thought that was something that was particularly, you know, striking in both the novels for me, uh, apart from many other things. Uh, and I, I love the fact that your novel emerged from really the use of, you know, stories about how these magical practices exist and how primarily women are the, you know, sorceresses, as it were. And, uh, of course, yours emerges from the point of the violence and, and also the, the uh, uh, violence of the armed forces, uh, which was, we were discussing in our book club, which was the, the, the last image that sort of stayed with, you know, me, for example. Th that's all. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the comment about screenplay, I think, you know, um, the m any good fiction, most good fiction, which is visual and where people find it readable and they engage, it adopts a lot of practice from the screenplay um, because you put everything in a scene for people to uh, visualize easily. So uh, I think a good screenplay, a good, good novel borrows a lot of techniques from the screenplay. I think we've run out of time now. So I'd like to thank both these young no novelists and I th thank the audience here for being with us and uh, have a great festival. Thank you. Thank you. We wish to thank our speakers, Hansda Sovendra.